this a little bit later. So we will be posting this on the Innovate Bio website, uh, probably be there sometime Monday. And I guess without further ado, I'd like to introduce two people who really in many ways need no introduction. Dr. Lisa Seidman and Dr. Jeanette Mowry, who have been teaching biotechnology for, I guess it's safe to say decades, although. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know yes. <laughs> yeah. Some decades, yes. Okay. Yeah. Teaching it well for and uh, forgetting more of it than probably many people I know have ever known. <laughs> We'll see. All, right. <laughs> All right, Lisa, take it away. Okay, well, thanks. So the first task I have is to share my screen and make it work. Okay. It worked. It worked, yay. That was the first obstacle. So I want to thank everybody for coming. And thanks, Sandy and Cassandra, for organizing. So what we're going to be talking about is reducing variability and enhancing reproducibility from the beginning. And I want to start out with an old Jewish folktale, actually. And according to this folktale, um, a very famous rabbi was uh, approached somewhat aggressively by a man who asked him to explain everything there is to know about Jewish law while he was standing on one foot. And according to the story, the rabbi complied, he stood on one foot and he said, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. That's everything you need to know, all the rest is commentary. So I thought about that folktale when I read this story about Deming. So as you probably know, um, Deming was a scholar, a statistician. He was a founder in, of an influential quality movement here in the United States and internationally. And the story is told about him that he was getting ready to teach a four day seminar on uh, quality improvement when he was approached by an executive. And the executive said that he was too busy to attend the seminar. And he asked Deming to save him time by summarizing Deming's methods in a few words. According to the story, Deming responded, you should focus on reducing variation. Now we don't know if he was standing on one foot when he did that, but he could have been, it was pretty short. So what Jeanette and I wanna do for the rest of this 50 minutes or so, is we're gonna do some commentary on Deming's comment of reducing variation. This idea of reducing variability is a really key one and it doesn't really matter what kind of environment you're teaching your students. So for those of you in more of a bioproduction, biomanufacturing kind of setting, it's really pretty obvious to students that if you have say a biopharmaceutical, say a drug, and the dosage varies, clearly that's bad. That could, reduce, that could result in even fatalities for patients. It's obviously undesirable. But for those of us who teach in programs that are maybe more research oriented, we have a slightly different, it, the, the concept takes a slightly different demeanor. We talk about enhancing reproducibility. In either case, it's important to do this to have a quality product. So in one case, your product might be a tangible thing like a drug. In another case, your product might be a research finding. Either way, you wanna reduce variability. So, and this idea in research has led to the concept of the reproducibility crisis or the term reproducibility crisis. This dates back to 2012. Um, scientists at Amgen could only reproduce six out of something over 40 groundbreaking research papers. And that kind of hit the um, science community pretty hard. And similarly, scientists at Bayer could only reproduce 25% of their results. And that led to the term reproducibility crisis. And a lot of scrutiny in the scientific community, a lot of work being done to understand why is research sometimes irreproducible and how can that be avoided? We think that to reduce variability or enhance reproducibility, we need to begin at the beginning. And I'm gonna, I don't wanna talk, there are books. I just, I don't wanna talk about these books at this moment, just to say that all the things that Jeanette and I are gonna be talking about in this seminar um, are in books, it's all been written down. Okay, so learning about variability. We have a course called Basic Lab Skills for Regulated Environment. And when we say basic, we don't mean electrophoresis, we don't mean PCR, we mean really basic, like how do you, the calculations for making one molar solution. Uh, basic measurement, like how do you measure volume and everybody of course teaches their students about pipettes. How do you measure weight, pH, light? Um, how do you make simple reagents? How do you make buffers? Assay is really important because assays 
are about the way that we get information in the lab. So it's really important for students to understand what an assay is and how to do it correctly. We do a little bit of centrifugation and filtration, but basically this is a very basic course. So on the surface, the students are practicing these really basic techniques, but there is a thread that's running, a current that's running underneath the whole course. And that's this idea about variability. How do we understand it? How do we observe it? How do we control it? Um, how do we reduce it? So Lisa, just one yeah. comment there. So when we talk about this course for our advisory committee for the program, the uh, members of the advisory committee, when they hear the title, basic lab skills for a regulated environment, they are ecstatic. They are so happy to hear that we actually put emphasis on the regulation of the environment too. Right. And yeah. they, they, they want students who've had the class. Sometimes they hire them with just that class. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, go ahead. So today I'm gonna, we require this class of every student in the program, um, but I'm gonna talk about a section that's for people who already have a bachelor's degree or post-baccalaureate section, which we teach once a year. There's other sections taught more often for the associate degree students. I'm not gonna talk about them today. So the students have in this particular section, they have at least a BS degree or maybe chemistry. Lots of them have graduate degrees, masters, PhDs. Sometimes they have lots of industry experience. So we're gonna be showing you results from participants who are qualified to begin working at least as an entry level technician or scientist, but many of them are far beyond that. And the reason I wanna show you data from this section is because we learn a lot about variability and where it comes from in the workplace by looking at the results of what happens with these people. So the way the course works is there's some lecture, we introduce them to GMP, we introduce them to regulatory affairs, and then they do a series of laboratory exercises. And then the really important thing is they put their data up on the blackboard or whiteboard and they discuss it. And the discussions are student led and I really try to be quiet during these discussions. So when I say begin at the beginning, I mean it. This is gonna be an activity where all the students have to do is read the value of measuring devices. So for you, don't try to read all these numbers, a lot of numbers here. I'm gonna go through this a bit. There are three different devices we're working with. Thermometers on the left. There are three of them, three thermometers, A, B, and C. They've been placed in a beaker of water that is equilibrated to room temperature over a period of time, so it is equilibrated. They measure the length of some objects with a ruler, and then they measure the volume of water in graduated cylinders. Uh, we just throw food coloring in there to make it easy to read. And this is, and then they put their data up on the board and they discuss it. If we just look at thermometers, we can talk about that for a minute. So one of the things we ask the students, they're, or they're guided through these questions in their lab manual, do we expect the readings to be the same? If we just use a single thermometer, would it be more consistent? Would it be more accurate? Why is there variability in the readings? So these are questions for them to think about. They usually realize that one possibility is maybe the water is not homogeneous or the temperature is not constant because variability in a sample or whatever you're measuring is always one possibility. But usually the students realize that for this particular example, if the water is equilibrated, that's probably not the biggest source of variability. So assuming it's homogeneous and the temperature is constant, then maybe the variation is due to differences in how the students have read the level. And it's certainly true that people do sometimes read, particularly when we're looking at a, a line, might read it a little bit differently. They might also make mistakes in technique like touching the thermometer, which is not correct, not immersing it properly. So these thermometers, uh, these are spirit thermometers and expensive ones. They have a line and on them, that's the line to which the thermometer is supposed to be immersed. So very often they'll take them out, maybe they'll immerse them a different distance. And that could be a subtle mistake. And by the way, I did forget to say, um, when we first started that, if people have questions as we go along, um, maybe you could put them into the chat and then um, Sandy or Cassandra or Jeanette, you know, can we, can we can answer some of them as we go along. So people's technique is always a second possibility for bringing in variability. But we, they realize easily when they look at these three thermometers, there's more variability between the three thermometers than within any one thermometer which is telling them that probably they've got variability coming in from the instrument. And then we talk about how much variability is allowable from an instrument, how much can be tolerated. 
We talk about the specifications for this particular kind of thermometer. And we ask the question, is this much variability okay? And the question, given this variability, do we know the actual temperature of the water? And if we just looked at one thermometer or one reading and we just assumed it was correct, would we maybe be deceived by that? Now, this question of, is this much variability okay? And do we actually know the temperature of the water? I'm going to evade that question completely right now. I really try hard not to answer this with the students. We'll come back to this question later. It's a really key question, but I'm not gonna answer it. So the answer, not, not now. <laughs> Got it. Um, and then I wanna point out just a small point about significant figures. Um, if we look at the volume measurements, if you look at column four, for example, the first student said 15.1 mils, the second student said 14.57 mils. So the first student's got three significant figures and the second student's got four significant figures. And then they say, you know, you look at these data and they say, well, is there a right way and a wrong way? And yes, there is a right way and a wrong way based on a convention about how we are supposed to record significant figures. And the point is that I don't know which way, which of these students is right and which is wrong unless I look at the graduated cylinder myself. And that point is important because if a person is reading these kind of analog readings and then recording the value by hand, there's no way to go back and fix that mistake or almost no way to go back and fix that mistake if somebody makes a mistake. So that's the kind of thing you wanna do correctly the first time. It's maybe could be considered a documentation error if you do it incorrectly. Is this important? Again, I'm not gonna to try to answer that question, at least not right now. So we now, we've done this very simple activity, but we've already started to look at categories that bring us variability, variation in technique, uh, mistakes that people might make. There might be variation in the sample or the subject. Now that's not very important uh, for the water, but that could be very important with biological samples. Instruments, their construction, their calibration, their operation, the, oper uh, the environment, uh, temperature, very important for pH, also important for high uh, accuracy weight measurements for small volumes, small amounts. So all of these three categories give us variability. So at this point, the students have sort of started to explore these three, um, these three categories that can give us variability. And in fact, this is sort of a mystical idea. We expect some variability in all measurements, even when experts make measurements, even when they do everything as well as they can, there is still variability. And if we don't see it, it's because the sense, it might be because the system is insensitive enough. So if the variability is out at the fourth decimal place on some device and it only reads to two decimal places like a balance, then we're not gonna see the variability, but the variability is still there. And then sometimes it just means the measuring instrument isn't working. So an example of this, um, this happens pretty often in the associate degree classes, particularly a student will say, my pH is rock solid, 7.62, 7.62. I even did this procedure and it's still 7.62. And it turns out when you look carefully, the students did not immerse the probe in the sample. So sometimes a really rock solid measurement means that something's wrong. Nonetheless, we wanna reduce variability. So then I'm gonna talk about making reagents, which adds a little bit of complexity. We've already talked about with the students before we get here, how to use a balance out of pipette and so on. Now they're gonna make some reagents where they have to weigh something, measure volumes, combine them, do some calculations. To begin with, they make four simple reagents, saline, which is the easiest one we can think of, calcium chloride, magnesium chloride, and one mg per mil BSA. Now it's really important, we're talking about variability. So we need a way to see variability. We need a way to detect it. And this is basically a quality control procedure. What we use is conductivity measurements. Um, not ideal for, in every case, but they're pretty good. And with conducti conductivity is a fairly inexpensive instrument. So it's pretty easy to um, get one. What we usually do is we have one student calibrate a conductivity meter and then the students line up behind that student and they all measure the conductivity of their solutions uh, one after the other using that one conductivity meter. So then we get values and we have data. So what I'm gonna do is show you that data 
Um, and what I'm gonna do first is to run really quickly through images of what it looks like on the board. Don't try to read them. I'm gonna make it easier to read in a minute. Um, I'll show it in a more organized way. So here's one year's data for this activity, another year, nicely. This person made a very nice table. Uh, another year, another year, not such a nice table, but interesting data. And here it is, um, I put it into a more easy to read table. This is the results for saline. Um, the very top value is for Jessie, who is our lab manager. We sometimes tell the students to assume that she's right. And we ask them, is that a good assumption? Um, but again, I'm not gonna answer that question. But I put arrows on two of the values, uh, 1,520, which I had trouble reading. So I said it's somewhat illegible, a documentation problem. And then D who had 1,500, these the units should be microsiemens per centimeter. So at this point, usually what happens is that student D for example, didn't realize that there was anything maybe wrong with their solution until they see the other student's data. And then they look at that and they go, whoa, maybe I made a mistake. And then the students, because again, this is student driven, they will usually think to look at that person's calculations. Sometimes an off by, off by 10 calculation is the problem, which doesn't look like the problem here because it would still be a little high, but the students will evaluate it. And very often in the case like this, they figure out what was wrong. So we can often just leave the students to figure this out. If we go down to the bottom, we see that even if we, and, and, and then, well, that is a question though, um, why are those two values different? And can we throw them away? So one of the first things students wanna do with their own data is to throw away the outliers. And we talk about, no, we have to look at these. We have to try to figure out why they're different. We don't just throw them away, we think about them. But then that brings us to the last question. Even if we figure out what's wrong with those two, we still have a range from 12,300 to 14,500 microsiemens per centimeter. Is that much variability okay? And again, I'm not gonna try to answer that question right now, but the students will try to answer it and they will usually think about that. So the point so far, if we are gonna control variability, we have to detect it. There is the documentation issue, really important we know to employers, just really important in the workplace. Sometimes calculations are a problem, we all know that. And then they would get to the actual production of the solution. And we can't take it for granted that they're doing it properly, even the most simple solutions. So here we have sophisticated students and every year we're gonna have some problems with one or more of these solutions, even the most simple ones, even saline. If we don't do any quality control steps, we're not gonna see the mistakes. So then we have these questions, which I'm not answering. How do we handle the outliers and how much variability is acceptable? Here's data from a year where we have magnesium chloride, 50 millimolar. This data is all over the map. Well, not all over, but it's pretty variable. And then the question the students need to decide is what to do now. If they don't come to this themselves, I will tell them to do it again, maybe in teams, maybe working together. Somehow they have to work this out because this is not okay. They should be able to do better than this with magnesium chloride. And every year, there's something which just goes, hey, why you're like this? And then sure enough, the students spend half an hour and they figure out what the problem is. Here's another situation. Um, here we have the first value that I flagged, 24,300, almost for sure an off by 10 error. They're really common. But then we come down to the bottom one, 1,500, which gives us a range of 1,500 to 2,910, which is almost double. And so we ask the students to think about that. Is that 1,500 close enough? And again, the students will usually come to this themselves. They'll troubleshoot that value. And sometimes they'll find a mistake in, in something like that. And then lastly, I wanna show you BSA. Okay, BSA is really variable every year. Um, this is a low concentration. Uh, we suspect, and I've never explored this, but this would be an interesting little project. I don't think conductivity is the best way um, to measure uh, very variability in BSA. But the other thing we do know about BSA is that it's very difficult to weigh out. So we're asking them to make a low concentration, but we don't want to ask them to make more because it's expensive. We're asking them to make a low concentration and it's very powdery. It tends to develop static charge. It's a classic example of something that is difficult to weigh and it brings up all the problems with weight measurements that we can run into. 
So we take it for granted that it's easy to weigh out chemicals accurately. We just sort of assume our students can do that. And that's not always true. So BSA is a really great example of why it's not so simple. And that variability occurs every year. But we found even the magnesium chloride can be problematic. So this is a little bit of an aside on the subject of weighing. You have a technician weighing out a chemical in a regulated environment. And an inspector comes along and says to the student or the technician or scientist, how much chemical did you weigh out? And the person would presumably look at the display on the balance and they'd say, well, I weighed out so many grams. And then maybe the inspector says, how do you know that what is displayed on the balance is correct? Now, at that point, we would like our students to give a fairly sophisticated answer. We would like them to be able to say something like, I calibrate the balance with standards that were traceable to NIST. We would like them to sort of have a sense of what NIST is and what calibration is and what does traceability mean. So we want them to be able to work in a conscious manner and to really kind of get um, how do you ensure accuracy um, in these kinds of measurements. Okay, I'm gonna turn this over to Jeanette because now we get to the hard part and I'm gonna yeah. leave that to talk about that. Okay, pH, ah, pH. Um, so I probably, when I first started teaching in the program, I probably learned more about pH and how oblivious I had been to pH in my career in research and at a, and a company. So um, the reason that it's uh, so much more complex and adds that level of complexity is because the instrumentation is more complex. You've got multiple components to the instrumentation. You've got to maintain an electrode. You've got to check the efficiency of the electrode. You've got to fill the electrode solution. You've got to take into account the effects of temperature, not only on the electrode, but on the sample itself. And then you have this, the difficulty of pH. What is pH? It's a complicated concept. So I'm gonna show some data um, from the, some, of the, some of the same uh, students that we had there, there are several slides. And it, again, it's, it's reiterating the, the concept of why you need quality control uh, because of the complexity of pH. So Sandy, are you advancing slides or am I doing it? Oh, I can do it. I can doing do it. it. Yeah. Okay, okay, I did it, yeah. yeah. Okay, so the first slide here is, is showing just a one molar twist buffer. And, you know, the students' pHs line up pretty well, except for Lana's. And Lana, probably without having a quality control measure, without comparing to the other students, probably wouldn't really think that there was anything wrong with her 8.14. It doesn't look that bad. But if you look at conductivity as well, you can see that probably what happened is that she didn't add quite enough HCl. She stopped too soon in bringing the the pH down to pH 8. Um, so, you know, everyone learns from this, but Lana probably learned the most in that one. Um, okay, Lisa, next slide. This slide is about making a more complicated buffer. It's multi-component solution. Uh, it is based on TRIS as well. Um, and all the students' pH data agree pretty well, and their conductivity agrees pretty well. I mean, we can argue you know, is it perfect or not? Or is it within the boundaries of the specifications of what we're looking for? But it looks pretty good. Um, but Saeed's data, which is this 6.76 and the 35.1 millisiemens, um, was, is not in line with the rest of the students. And Saeed is a PhD scientist from Nigeria, um, a very diligent person who uh, supervises technicians and students in his own lab writes grants, does research. And he was very concerned and you know, a little bit upset that his uh, solution was not really right. And he started thinking about all the ways that he could work on quality control with his own students and technicians. So it was really uh, eye-opening for him. Okay, next slide, Lisa. And this slide uh, is just screaming why you need conductivity because the pHs all line up almost perfectly. But is this okay, different from these other conductivity measurements? I would argue, no, that's telling you some really important information and probably it it's about weight. It's probably a, a weighing uh, act error uh, to create that. And then you can get more of a fine point on it with, with the agreement with the 26.8 from the 33.1. Is that okay? Again, we're kind of bailing on how much variability is okay, but certainly this is concerning. Okay, next slide, Lisa. Oh, and then we have TE buffer. Um, notoriously hard to make because of the way you have to get the EDTA in solution with the sodium hydroxide, but this is all over the map. 
and uh, we would probably let the students talk about, you know, what to do about this and, you know, possibly make it over, although our lab coordinator hates for us to make the solution anyway, so we probably would, wouldn't, depending on what we were going to use it for. Okay, um, next slide, Lisa. Okay, yes, we did go to the lab. Um, not just to teach. We actually went to the lab to do, to do um, some research of our own. And the way this came about was we had a, a group of students in the post -bac program, and they were really a very stellar group of students. Um, and they were getting a lot of variability on their pH measurements for almost the entire time they were working uh, in the class. And that was concerning to Lisa, but it was also concerning to the students. They, you know, they were pretty perplexed as to what was going on. So Lisa decided to give two of those students, two of the most stellar, like with the greatest attention to detail, gave them a project to take one buffer and uh, using all the pH meters in our lab, see if they could get decent agreement or at least some more consistency than what they were getting. Um, and basically at the end of, the, of that project, it was the variability was still there. It was still all over the place. So, Lisa kind of thought, well, maybe we can do better. So she enlisted me to go with her into the lab in the summer. And we spent uh, two days at least, uh, maybe longer. Yeah, longer. We, yeah, we, we did chapter and verse on pH meters. I mean, we had the manuals out. We were determining efficiency. We were figuring out whether the electrode needed to be retired. We were controlling for temperature. We actually did find one electrode that needed to be retired based on its efficiency. Um, and OK make a long story shorter, we were able to get plus or minus 0 0.1 pH units in terms of agreement. Still, that's the best we could do, okay? So we were, you know, and this is, we, have, we did have multiple manufacturers for the pH meters. I mean, there were some th things we needed to contend with here, but is that good enough? Well, for a teaching lab, one, one could argue, yes, it is good enough for a teaching lab. But what does Mettler say? So um, Mettler says, perform your next pH measurement in compliance with USP. A successful calibration will result in a reading that is within plus or minus 0 0.05 pH units of the pH value of the verification buffer at the measuring temperature. They go on to, to explain that a little bit and to say that USP demands a pH meter with a precision of plus or minus 0 0.02 pH units. Okay, now this is talking about the verification or calibration standardization process, not necessarily what your specification would say your variability had to be for a particular uh, solution you were measuring. But this is tough to achieve. Um, and it would be impossible to achieve without knowing all the things, all the sources of variability that we've already talked about, the temperature effects. What does the sample do? How does the electrode maintain? Is the electrode still good? Is, you know, is, is the spilling solution there? Is it been, is the filling solution um, hole been opened? Is the junction clogged? All of these things that are discussed in the book, okay? Um, and that we teach our students and that I was blissfully mostly unaware of when I first joined the program. So, all right, I'm gonna turn it back over to Lisa. Okay. Okay, so um, I'm going to show you another thing from Mettler. So don't try to read the slide yet. I'm just going to try to explain this a little bit. So Mettler, by the way, has wonderful resources. So for those of you who get kind of interested in measurements and uh, any all different kinds of measurements, uh, Mettler has a library. It's all free, really good, well-written stuff. And all you have to do is set up an account with them and you can just freely download their stuff. So I strongly recommend it. They did a webinar on pipetting and how do you get accurate results in pipetting. So what they have this, they had this was done by a statistician. This, this webinar was presented by statisticians, professionals in this area. And they have the concept of error propagation. Now I'm gonna say that I cannot explain this the way a statistician would, but I get the idea of error propagation just as a lab person working in the lab. So what they're saying is you have, say, a complicated procedure like next generation DNA sequencing. They show a graphic of it on the right. And in order to do this procedure, you have a lot of pipetting steps, maybe 39 individual pipetting steps, or in another case, 24 pipetting steps. Each of those steps gives you an opportunity to introduce variability 
or the word error. And they're using the word somewhat interchangeably. They're not synonyms, but they're strongly related. So if you're putting in a little bit of er error or variability at each of these 39 or 24 pipetting steps, that error, that little bitty bit of error or variability is going to propagate or accumulate as you do the procedure. So errors that you put in in the beginning, and it's something like just pipetting, is going to influence and can have a heavy influence on your results at the end. And they, they have this slide which talks about where do you get the error from. And these are all the things we've already mentioned, incorrect calculations, samples and reagent preparation errors or instability, instrument usage errors, inaccurate pipettes or pipetting because it's about pipetting. The more complex the experiment, the greater the chance of error propagation. They use serial dilutions in their webinar as an example because it's prone to error propagation. And we have also added, students have to read the instruments correctly um, and documentation, which can be, you know, these are two more sort of basic ways that we can get variability or error propagation. And Jeanette, did you want to add something? Here yeah, just that? To, I mean, we see the error propagation all the time in the protein purification course because we do an enzyme assay and they often have to do serial dilutions because you don't want to use, you know, a lot of your sample. And in order to do the assay accurately, you've got to have the right amount. Um, but then once you have to, you know, go through all the calculations, add the re different reagents, then you've got to magnify back by the dilution factor and that really, you know, magnifies whatever error you had to begin with in your sample. So, you know, we talk about that, the error propagation part. And it's pipetting. I mean, we're talking, this is mostly pipetting, although you have yeah. to make the solution correctly to begin with. Yep. Okay. So this is sort of a summary slide. Um, we, want to we want to reduce variability. We want to increase reproducibility. That's basic. If we don't look for it, we won't know it's there. Reducing variability requires reducing mistakes. Um, it's also about control, controlling temperature effects, controlling how we operate and maintain instruments. And we're only talking here about the most basic aspects of work. We're also talking about results from students who are sophisticated and experienced. And what this is basically telling us is that variability creeps in, even for people who are sophisticated, even for people who are doing things that are pretty basic and essential. And we also have talked about how errors made in these very basic things at the beginning of our procedure, they follow through, they accumulate and they adversely affect the final results. And so it's really important to look at this variability and understand it and reduce it. So, and I'm not going to give a huge answer to this big question. The big question was how much variability is acceptable. So we're talking about that through the entire course and the students are sort of mulling over it. And basically the answer is, it's a really good question and it depends. And it depends a lot on the situation. So we make the obvious point that if you're making a drug product, you can't tolerate very much variability or error in that drug product. If you're making a coffee mug, maybe more variability is gonna be okay. And so the students will sometimes be thinking about that as they move into their projects and they try to figure out, like they do little research projects, figure out how much variability is going to be okay in that little research project they're doing. Okay, and I'm just now gonna return the very end. I'm gonna to return to the idea that these, that what we're doing is in books. And as Sandy said in her introduction um, to this, we have put together textbooks. The one on the left, Basic Laboratory Methods for Biotechnology, Textbook and Laboratory Reference. The third edition was just published by CRC Press. We're very happy to have it out. We call it the big book because it is really big and it's really heavy. It's about a thousand pages. It is available as an ebook. The book on the right is the lab manual. And what we've been talking about is activities that are in this lab manual. It does go past what we've talked about into some cell culture and electrophoresis and so on. But basically it begins with all this basic stuff. The two books um, are interrelated, although the lab manual can more or less stand by itself. Now, the big book is available now from CRC Press. We are told that it is available uh, for desk copies, uh, at least an e-version is available to you, so you can get it. The lab manual will be available for free to students who have the basic, the big book. It's not yet available. Um, online. So it will be freely available online once CRC figures out how to get it up there. Um, at the moment, it's still being supported by 
Pearson. So you should still be able to get it if you wanted it um, as a published book. And eventually CRC is supposed to also publish it so that people could buy it as a published book, uh, written book. And then there's also a third book that again, all three overlap, uh, basic laboratory calculations, also available desk copies from CRC Press, second edition. And um, very basic calculations we're talking about here. It's intended to be a friendly guide um, for students who maybe are a little, well, for many students, but students are often uncomfortable with the calculations. They need a little practice. And this is intended to guide them through calculations so that they are not an obstacle and a barrier for students getting into this profession. And so I'm going to stop here with thank you to everybody for coming and um, questions. And so Sandy, are there, Cassandra, are there any questions we should know about in the chat? I only see one thing. So I don't have the chat up. Uh, I don't see any questions yet, Lisa. Okay. But All maybe right. if you want to uh, close your presentation, we could kind of- Okay, I'll stop the share. Go back okay. to Hollywood Squares and maybe people could just ask them. <laughs> sure. Yes, and we talked, we had this time for 50 minutes, but we talked fast. Yeah, we did. Okay. So go ahead if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question. Okay. Well, I, I have one. Um, so with some of these, like like the one where you had the guy whose pH was off by a whole pH point. Yeah. What what caused that? Um, I don't remember. But I do know, I do remember that he was upset and he immediately went back and made it again and it was fine. And he may or may not have even told me what he did wrong the first time. But I think part of what happened is he rushed. I think that was the fundamental problem is he rushed. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, he felt like he was behind. Um, the students more or less move through these things individually, but sometimes they look at other students and say, wow, they're all ahead of me, you know, I got to, I'm not keeping up and they, they, that's when they start to make mistakes. I really like that you're putting all the results up on the board because I think there's any kind of opportunity for self-correction. It's always such a good thing. Yeah, it's so valuable. Yeah, it is. So Josh has a question. Yes, I do. I appreciate your time and your overview today. And I will say for my intro lab technique course, um, I do a lot of similar exercises with looking at reducing variability and then talking about production setting versus uh, reproducibility in a research setting. Um, my question is, in curriculum that involves more advanced lab techniques, um, we have coursework on cell culture, protein purification, and so forth. Uh, I'm thinking about how we talk about reducing variability or enhancing reproducibility in those contexts, uh, the way we teach those courses, we often only have one chance for students to do some activity, some part of their mm -hmm. project, whereas in the intro class, we not only collect the class data and everyone looks at their one pH reading relative to the class, but the students take dozens of pH readings by the end of the term. So they look at their own reducing variability in their technique. So um, that's just a, a bit of a teaching philosophical question I have at times is mm -hmm. for some of this coursework, would our students be better served to narrow the scope and the range of activities we teach in lab? So there's more time to really focus on enhancing reproducibility of a smaller number of protocols? Or is it a better learning objective for these students to do something different every week and just get them the maximum breadth of exposure? Um, I'm kind of tussling with that question a little bit. And, you know, as you said, begin at the beginning, reducing variability is a key across all aspects. Um, I'm kind of reconsidering um, the scope of our curriculum for some of our more advanced classes and curious to see what your take might be on those type of courses. I have a quick follow up to that. So the students that are taking your more advanced classes, are they also taking that intro class? Yes, the intro class is the prerequisite. So they learn pipetting, pH meters, spectrophotometers, uh, making buffers, so forth, mm -hmm. before they move on to cell that, culture. As long as they've had that, then that kind of um, informs my response to the, you know, I mean, you can only do 
so much repetition and protein purification before the semester is over with. <laughs> So, so even though I teach protein purification, so that's why I'm responding. So you, we put the data on the board. And so they see the variability. We still put the variability, you know, put the data on the board. However, we don't repeat it. Like Lisa says, go back and make magnesium chloride again. Well, we don't do that. Okay. So the danger is they're left with no product at the end of the semester, right? Because we're making a product. We're, we're purifying something. But... They've had the class, they've had Lisa's class, they've had that basic lab skills before. So I don't, I, I can't completely answer your question, but I can say that you, at some point you gotta just do the procedure or otherwise they miss the point, you know. The you know, all I'll say is I don't have an answer. Yeah. I know that the putting the boundaries around what you teach is like the biggest issue for every teacher in the whole world, deciding this is inside my boundary and this is too much. And so Josh, you're really struggling with that. And- But you're already doing good things by doing the basic yeah. part. So what, what our, our message is always to learn those basics, you have to learn them independently of PCR and CRISPR, right? Yeah. You can't, if you're, if you're focused on pro, even protein purification, you're not really going to be thinking about variability and consistency in making your solution. Right. So at some point in your curriculum, you have to focus on only that. I guess that, that's the way I would answer it. And after that, you got to decide. <laughs> yeah. And I think every program, I mean, all of you are presumably from programs, you may have other answers. You know, our yeah. program made some decisions and yeah, I don't know that there's a right answer and a wrong answer. Yeah. Sure. Oh, I just yeah. You mentioned variability, oh, sorry, uh, variability creep and the stealthiness of it. I, we teach the intro course and then students get so focused on their project and we see the variability creep back up in basic measurements and pH readings and so forth. So it's just, it's a question I'm reflecting on. It will it best serve the students in their transition to the workplace to really slow down in class each time that happens and say, wait a moment, we're all gonna keep repeating a little more on these basic measurements, review the basics like more extensively or a brief reminder and then forge ahead with the project. And uh, so I'm kind of experimenting with that. And I think uh, the framework you presented today makes me think uh, I wanna spend a little more time reinforcing the basics that students will be best served in that regard. Yeah, that's great. Good. And I see Purnima and somebody else has a raised hand. I, I think Maybe. Daniel, Daniel is first. Okay. I, I can let Daniel go. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I'm, I'm just curious. I know with students, if you, if you focus on this too much, then they're following a protocol and they have a step like rinse with 300 mils of water and they will obsess and try to measure exactly 300 <laughs> mils when it's not really important. Yeah. So I was just curious how you uh, bring, I, you said, talk about how much variability matters, mm -hmm. but how do you bring that in? Like, for sake of time, you don't need to measure this closely, but this one is super critical. And then do you want to answer that from like proteins point of view? Uh, well, I think it's just time at the lab bench that gives you that. I mean, I don't think there's any real, you can, you can somewhat lead a student to say, see how that's not important, you know? I mean, see how that really wouldn't make a difference. But until they're more comfortable in their own lab skin, I don't think I don't think you're going to be yeah. able to. Just I mean, I think you're out. absolutely right. I mean that that happens. But I will also say I remember a student, um, Sarah, who Jeanette will probably remember, who was extremely compulsive about all the things that didn't matter, and she was just she would be in the lab forever. But she was the only one who could grow. She was growing orchids. Yes. And, and it turned <laughs> out that nobody else in the whole world got orchids to grow except for Sarah. Yeah, because she was so compulsive. So I don't. <laughs> I get, growing I orchids, are, you got to be compulsive. I mean, I probably couldn't grow orchids, but <laughs> so again, but, yeah. yeah, I don't. I don't have good answers to either of the questions that you guys. Those are really good up. questions. They're yeah. really good questions. Yeah. Uh, I guess Purnima. Yeah, Lisa, thank you. Um, actually, um, more than a question, I think I was kind of chiming in and, and Daniel's uh, thing got me a second point to chime in. Um, so uh, regarding that uh, absolute uh, to the T following uh, uh, to the SOP, um, it is 
really important, especially, I mean, coming from, um, this is something I've seen in the biomanufacturing when uh, mm-hmm. uh, in uh, companies where they have to, uh, to follow that something that's to compliance and published and everything. So yes, they, it's so important for the students to actually follow every millimeter, micrometer, microliter to the, to the point. But at the same time, um, it's also important for them to realize that like at anything, um, um, it's they they for that purpose they have something called deviation reports because you do have that slight modifications they have to deviate from what's on the SOPs. So when you do that, it's very important to document that you did deviate because the pH didn't hit um, what it was supposed to be. So if you're supposed to add 300 milliliters, you may have had to add 310 to get that pH. So the objective is to hit the pH, not that you have to add 300. So then you have to actually report out that you actually did add that extra 10 in the, uh, so, and it's, it's so difficult to, I guess, teach that because now it's very contextual. It's like, if you're doing this, then you need to do this. If not, then don't. Uh, that's one. And so, well, I guess my one question is, well, could that be in the intro or is that too much? Would that be too confusing, right? Um, then uh, the, uh, the other piece I was, uh, I was thinking of adding is uh, from a previous conversation. Um, so uh, while st- students are making buffers and learning how much to add and how to weigh and all those uh, basics, um, one thing that is noticeable is depending on what they are adjusting pH, if it's buffers, plain buffers, you know, then that's one. But if they're trying to adjust, for example, a protein, uh, the pH of a protein. So if you've harvested, you've eluted with a very low pH and you have to bring the pH back up, then how you add makes such a big difference because if you add it rapidly, you actually precipitate and destroy the whole product. <laughs> but you have to add it dropwise and you have to make sure that the, you have to cal- make sure, I mean, it's all written down, add dropwise, but they need to understand what visually it looks like. If mm-hmm. you're adding, if that dropwise is too big a drop, you have to go smaller a drop because yeah, you're now right. precipitating the protein out. Yeah. So uh, again, uh, yeah, it's basic pipetting skill, but mm-hmm. how basic? So I just thought I'll kind of add that there. Yeah. All good points. <laughs> yeah, right, right, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a question. Do you talk in the book about some of the things that could be done in the procedure to minimize variability. For example, making a master mix. You mean when you're talking about PCR? Oh, PCR, DNA sequencing, yeah. uh, lots of things. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah, that's, that's in there. I don't know if it was in the context of variability. Um, so is that brought out as a specific point? In the context of PCR, it's mentioned. But yeah, it is a more general point. It's something we could think about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, we, we do stocks, which is a sort of mm-hmm. somewhat of a version of master right. mix. I mean, it's a, a right. more simple version of that. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's true. A lot of the protein reagents are made that way for their proteins class. Mm-hmm. But this, but, yeah. this is a really good point. This is something I see in some teaching protocols, like transforming cells. They'll have students add E. coli to two separate tubes when it should have been the same tube if they're going to compare the results at the end. It's it's not exactly master mix, but it's the same mm-hmm. idea. Like you should make the original if you're going to compare as a control yeah. you know, with DNA, without right. DNA yeah. at the end. It, it bugs the heck out of me sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So I've yeah, rewritten true. some of these protocols, but um, yeah, this is a really, I think it's a good point. Right. But, yeah. And I mean, I think some yeah. of this, you know, do we, is that explicitly written in the book? I don't know if, if everything that you guys can think of is explicitly in the book or in the lab manual. But the point is, once the students are sensitive or you are sensitive as the teachers to this issue, they can mm-hmm. start to come up with ways themselves to reduce variability. You know, like making a master mix or adding it to one tube and then dividing it to. So yeah, I think once they're sensitive to the idea, then a lot of this will flow naturally, we hope, in their work. 
on a higher level, if I was doing any procedure that had 39 steps, I would do everything I could to make that fewer steps. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, apparently I, yeah. Yeah. Well, most you of would the know time we're not doing the step with 39 steps, but anyway. Oh, no, I, I, I understood. <laughs> And that was Methler's example, but we oh, do do Mettler. serial dilutions. I mean, we do them all yeah. the time. Yeah, yes. yeah. And you know, we might easily have six or seven pipetting steps, and that's definitely true. In you know, making a standard curve, which we do all the time in any you know most kind of assays, you know, we got multiple pipetting steps. So, yeah. I'm I'm curious. So we. To, to sort of show reproducibility between groups, we'll, we'll do things with color. We'll have food dye, have them pipette a series or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you find, so conductivity was a great idea and I'll, we'll have to look into using that. I, we've never used that, but just eyeballing the colors, do you think? Oh yeah, that, we do that a lot with you, yes. Start um, that. Start with is absolutely. that fairly, fairly accurate or are you finding like conductivity, conductivity is so much better? Um, well, yeah, it's, for a, for a yeah. buffer, yeah, for if you're making a biological solution which is colorless, you got to use conductivity. I mean, I mean, I don't know a better way to do that, but yeah, I mean, to start with the food coloring thing is great. Yeah, we use food coloring when we introduce spectrophotometry, yeah. and we introduce assays, and a lot of the times their first assays they're just doing serial dilutions basically of food coloring, and yeah, it's great because sure, as you say, they can look, and if their color say doesn't get like. Um, fainter and fainter as they go along, they made a mistake or they can look at another, if they having problems, they can look at another student. So yeah, color is great. I mean, we love food coloring. We go through a lot of food coloring every year uh, when we first start. So yes, it's great. But um, if you're gonna compare, if you're gonna see if your saline solution, as Jeanette said, if you're gonna see if your saline solution is right, color is not gonna help you. So yeah, we like conductivity. It's not perfect. I don't conductivity think it works. Conductivity or osmolarity, you can use osmolarity if you happen to have an osmometer, but most people yeah. have more, a conductivity tends to be more accessible than an osmometer. Yeah. And, and again, they're pretty cheap nowadays. You can get them pretty cheap and they're pretty cheap. I used to use out. refractometer too. Yeah. Yeah, I think what you have in your lab, there's different things you can use if it's available. Um, if you're starting from scratch, just buying a conductivity meter would be a good investment. I think also um, for some things, it really helps to have clear tubes. Yeah. <laughs> clear tubes <laughs> and a clear rack. Yeah. I found more, more mistakes by having a whole line of you yes. know, one mil to 1.5 mil tubes, right? And looking at that's the right. volumes. That's right. You know, yeah. once we, we do lots and lots, we're going to do lots and lots of serial dilutions and standard curves, lots and lots of those for the, all sorts of assays. The yeah. protein assays, the enzyme assays. Yeah. I mean, if the volume yeah. is off. Look at them. If they're not all the same level, then you probably right. have a problem. That's right. Yeah. Right. Um, I was wondering too. I I really like the data sets that you shared. Do you have? Are are those available somewhere? Are you keeping some of those? Because I think those could be like really good discussion points. Um, there are data sets in the PowerPoint because you mm -hmm. saw them. Those are the most clear. So there are more around. Mm -hmm. They're just photographs, you know, they're just JPEGs, uh, shots taken of the board. board. Those were the best ones I found when I was mm -hmm. looking through old. If anybody ever really wanted more, we might be able to find some more. And um, I haven't taught the associate degree section in years, but we might be able to get some from the associate degree sections from a different teacher. If somebody really wanted those, um, we might be able to get them. I, I'm yeah. not sure, but I'm thinking it wouldn't be bad to have case studies. Um, the ones that I showed in the pictures are the ones that my JPEGs are clear. You know, they're the best JPEGs that I have. But um, yeah, I mean, if we could talk about it offline, Sandy, and see if we can find some more. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm. I'm just curious about this. <laughs> Since this is a group that teaches these skills to students, do you guys have something that will stick in their head about micro pipettes and stopping at the first resistance? <laughs> do, you have, do you have a way to say it that really stays with students? Or do you also find that they forget? And they, they do forget, yes. Yeah. They learn all this in Lisa's class and then I get them in protein purification and we have to go over this again, you know? But um, 
usually if if they're starting they do some, you know a protein assay or a simple assay or something and it's you know all over the place the standard curve looks like you know crap so then i go okay could you show me how you're pipetting and you know usually we can correct it but these are small classes i mean i'm not sure how many people you have to correct but you know or you could just do it one more demo for the next class but yeah they didn't forget yeah. they definitely forget yeah yeah i, I don't just, think i yeah i don't I think i have the magic way if somebody had a mnemonic or i don't know just some... i don't know hmm. <laughs> song we, we need to come up with a song <laughs> yeah. well that was always why i had them in a clear rack on the edge so you could hold the rack up and you could see if anything was off yeah yeah, yeah. i do that when they finally get to the pcr and there's always a couple that are a little yeah. bit off yeah all right all right mm -hmm. I find if I tell them that they only have this much reagent and they have to pipette, like they only have like two microliters extra, that they tend to be more cognizant of proper technique if they know that they don't get any more. Well, but that's not a bad I idea. always have a little bit extra behind, but they don't know that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's actually yeah. a good idea. Give them yeah, an aliquot. Good idea. Aliquot that's too little if they overmeasure. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you only have like five microliters extra. So once it's gone, it's gone. And, and, and that helps them just think about it more. But yeah, yeah. Okay, well, it's been a great session. Are uh, any more questions before we? No, I appreciate I appreciate the questions and the comments. Yeah, they, yeah. they're good questions and That's to which we don't necessarily have any answers. Yeah. No, we don't have answers. <laughs> yeah, right. We have the same questions. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. No, it's a good discussion though, because yeah. I always want to think about yeah. where these things and come from. People have solved different parts of the problem, which is great. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. This was great. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. Thanks and, for uh, everybody for coming. I'm gonna stop recording.